From the ACLU, this is At Liberty. I'm Kendall Seesmeyer, your host. Ten years ago this July, Opal Tometi, Alicia Garza, and Patrice Cullors tweeted hashtag Black Lives Matter in the wake of Trayvon Martin's death. The hashtag helped galvanize a movement, calling out the racism that has determined the lives and deaths of Black people in America since its founding. The Black Lives Matter movement calls for the reimagination of institutions like policing, housing, education, and healthcare, with the hope of redressing the harms done to historically marginalized communities and building a more just country for all. As we look back on the last 10 years since the initial movement began, and three years since its resurgence following the murder of George Floyd, we want to better understand the history of Black Lives Matter and how it continues to shape American life. We are joined today by Wesley Lowry, a Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist who is widely regarded as the nation's leading reporter on the Black Lives Matter movement. Wesley has been covering BLM since the year it began and has written two books on race in America. His latest, American White Lash, A Changing Nation and the Cost of Progress, is a timely account of white Americans' backlash against evolving discourses on race, identity, and equity. We are excited to speak with him about Black Lives Matter's evolving legacy, the fervent backlash against it, and where the movement stands today. With that, Wesley, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. Thanks for having me. Happy to be here. So we have so much that we want to discuss with you, but I think that the best way to begin a conversation about Black Lives Matter's legacy is to understand the movement's goals. The 2014 killings of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and Eric Garner in New York City sparked the movement's early major protests. You went to Ferguson and covered BLM from its very early days. At a high level, what were the activists you met demanding? Of course. You know, I think that in a lot of ways— what the activists involved were demanding is and remains relatively simple, even as it's hyper-complex, right? At the core of this movement was this demand that people wanted our society to no longer be a place where Black life was treated as less than that of other people, um, in that when Black people were killed, be it by a police officer or by someone else, Uh, that the systems and the structures of our country seemingly suggested uh, that those lives didn't matter as much as other people. George Zimmerman initially wasn't even arrested for killing Trayvon Martin, uh, much less charged, right? Later on, he goes to trial and is acquitted. Uh, Cases like Eric Gardner and Michael Brown, where a Black person has been killed in the street by a police officer, and initially, there's very little information released. Uh, The stance of the government, of the police, seems to be, well, there's nothing to see here, there's nothing to worry about, and then ultimately these officers themselves were not held accountable. At its core, people were saying, we want this to stop. We want Black lives to be valued the way everyone else's are valued, and we want that to be reflected in the daily life of our society. Mm. Sounds simple enough, um, but as we know, it's been much more complicated than it needs to be. In 2016, protests continued after police brutality claimed the lives of Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Alton Sterling, Fernando Castile. And then we saw a white supremacist murder nine people at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, which is a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina. As the protests continued, policy changes in police departments and prosecutors' offices slowly began to follow. But what were some of the reforms that activists were able to achieve across the country in these kind of immediate following years? If you look at the years that immediately followed, that initial burst. You see uh, steps such as the widespread use of body cameras and body-worn cameras. You see legislation that's passed in many states and the creation of a common practice of referring these investigations to outside agencies. The idea that the police would no longer be investigating themselves um, or that it wouldn't just be the local prosecutor who was very close to police, right? The release of information 
we know much more about incidents in which police officers use force than ever before, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But at the time, very routine things were not being released. Very often, there wasn't even an announcement that the police had killed someone. And today, there is a much different environment in terms of what most departments believe they are obligated to tell the public, right? There have been real steps. The demands that were being made in the streets in 2014 are not necessarily the demands you're still hearing today, in part because of the victories of the year since. It's so important to note because I think oftentimes we can look at what hasn't happened and not necessarily look back and seeing like the progress that has been made, although it does feel slow and it doesn't feel ever enough. I wonder how the Obama presidency and technology of the time was able to create this fertile ground for the fight against police brutality to pick up the steam that it did then and that it continues to have now. Sure. I think it's no accident that this movement breaks through into the mainstream in the moment when it does. Now, first, and again, I think that sometimes in the media writ large, right, there's a tendency to oversimplify kind of the cycles of history, right? We're like, this thing starts on this day and then it ends on this. And it, and we know it doesn't quite work that way, right? Mm-hmm. But and, and so when we look at these issues, we know, first of all, as long as Black Americans have been seen as human uh, by our law, uh, there has been pressure and pushback from Black Americans who say that law enforcement is not treating them equitably. Uh, We see this through the civil rights movement. Uh, We see this in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Um, And so we can't talk about what happens in the 2010s without remembering what happened in the 90s, right? Remembering uh, these cases that played out in New York and LA. Now, what was different in this moment, I think, were two things. The first was that these things were playing out in the context of a Black president and a Black presidency that cut in some different directions. The first Mm -hmm. was that from a media perspective, there was a hyper-intense focus. Every time an issue arose, how will the Black president handle this, right? And so how will the Black president handle Trayvon Martin? How will the Black president handle Ferguson? That created a different media pressure and media narrative Um, And and in some cases, additional platform for these issues that might not have existed otherwise had the president been Joe Biden or or someone else, right? Mm -hmm. What was also true, though, was that you had young Black people in this country, many of whom had cast their first votes ever for Barack Obama, who had come into politics believing that a Black person could become the president of the United States. And so it forced them into a more radical politics, right? That the thing about a Black presidency, is that it provides permission to believe about things bigger and more radical than Mm. a Black presidency. Beyond representation. Correct, right? And so Mm -hmm. we see a moment where so much of our politics in this moment is, is a debate and a push between representational politics or different types of politics. And we see this not just in Black spaces. We see this unquestionably in feminist spaces and conversations about What do you do now with an aging uh, set of trailblazers? What do you do with people who represent representational victories, but maybe who don't actually align with the politics of this moment? So all of that was true. You had young Black people in this country, many of whom had voted for Barack Obama not once but twice. Some of them had believed, all right, we can change this country, we can get to a place Uh, where things are handled differently. They saw the vitriol that the Obama presidency was met with, the racism that 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 presidency was met with. And then Trayvon Martin is killed and Michael Brown is killed. And so I remember at the time people used to say, well, why all these these young people in the streets? Why don't they go vote? Why don't they go get active, right? First of all, protest is the oldest form of speech in our democracy, right? In some Mm -hmm. ways, it's the most pure form of speech. Uh, But second, that very often people are protesting not because they refuse to engage in politics, but because they have engaged in politics and the politics has failed them. Yeah, absolutely. We at the ACLU always say that um, protest is patriotic. So that it Mm. is an active form of living out a democracy. I want to pivot to the other trend that we see at this time, the other movement, if you will, concurrent to the rise of BLM, we see backlash by white Americans become increasingly mainstream. You actually start American white lash by discussing Obama's 2008 election and the rush to white supremacist websites and increase in hate crimes that followed. 
I was wondering why you began here and what do we lose when we focus on the 2016 election, perhaps, as the beginning of the white lash that we are experiencing today? Well, I think that we have to understand, right, in our politics and in our history, the moments we live in are almost always in some way a response to the moments we are exiting, Mm. right? And by the time we get to Donald Trump, we have come through an intensely political, an intensely difficult era. We have elected a black man to be our president. He's been our president for eight years. And in that time, we have seen almost immediately a thrashing within much of the American electorate. And it manifests itself in a lot of different ways, right? We see a more political form of it. And so we see establishment Republicans who vow that they are going to undermine the the Obama presidency at every step, which is not a rhetoric you would necessarily always use to talk about a president, even of an opposing party back then. Not that it had never happened. We'd seen this with Clinton and, and Gingrich. You have a grassroots response to this in the Tea Party, ostensibly about issues of economy and, and fiscal health. All of this is happening at a time when the country has undergone its most drastic demographic changes in a hundred years due to immigration. And at a time when that was creating massive anxiety among much of the country, we were at the time in an economic downturn. And so what we saw was a moment that was primed for a nativism, for a suspicion of people who look different and are different, We had massive technological advances that were upending the economy, upending communication, upending institutions. And again, demographically, we see massive changes in the makeup of our country and and in ways that lead a lot of people to be scared that they've lost something or that they're losing something. Mm -hmm. We have a party that weaponizes that. And the problem is... If you, as the president of the United States, as the leader of a political party, if you tell people that there's an invasion happening, rapists and murderers are coming over the border, that we're losing our country, our border doesn't exist, the vast majority of people may understand this is bluster, that this is exaggeration, this is hyperbole. We're a country of tens of millions of people. All it takes is a small percentage of people to take this type of hyperbolic rhetoric seriously to see the type of carnage that we have seen in recent years. And the white lash that we've seen in recent years, which you write about, takes many different forms, which we'll discuss. But your book specifically focuses on the proliferation of hate crimes during this era. You write that the goal of American white lash is to, in quotes, put human faces on the relentless cycle of violence that has defined American history flesh and bone on our discussion of white supremacist terror. Why was that so important to you? You know, my first book, uh, They Can't Kill Us All, which looked at the early years of Black Lives Matter, published the week after Donald Trump's election. And I'm sitting and I'm watching, and I'm watching these headlines. I'm watching stories about Nazis doing Hail Hitler outside of the inauguration. I'm watching stories of of a Muslim woman being harassed on a train outside Portland. I'm watching and you know and helping cover uh, violence such as what happened um, at Tree of Life in Pittsburgh or in El Paso, right? And it became very clear to me very early on that the next chapter in this story was going to be one not about what came next necessarily for the Black Lives Matter movement, although that was part of that chapter as well, Mm. but about this counter movement, about this violence that was now arising in part as a response to Black Lives Matter. Yeah, absolutely. In the book, you specify a few different moments. For many, I think we all remember the 2017 Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, which was one of the first moments that we saw white lash in the eye, many of us, that was the first moment. We were able to watch it across our TV. We were able to read about it. Charlottesville is just one of six cases of white supremacist violence that you structure the book around. But I'm wondering about that case in in particular. What was it like to write about it? and, And what did you want to show with that case? Sure. So what I wanted to do and what I wanted to look at was... How do I look at all of the different communities 
who fall victim to this type of white lash and white supremacist violence. And so it's anti-immigrant and anti anti-refugee violence, anti-Semitic violence, anti-Black violence, um, Islamophobic violence. Because what we know is that the person who shoots up Tree of Life could have just as easily been the person who shot up the top supermarket in Buffalo or, or in Charleston um, or, or could have leveled the attack in El Paso, that these white supremacists have a conspiratorial but mm. coherent ideology. They believe a conspiracy theory that involves all of us, right? That in a lot of ways, Charlottesville is a remarkable example, a microcosm of this idea of white lash. Literally, a, a middle schooler wrote an essay saying they should take the statues down, and the Nazis rallied and murdered someone. Yeah. It's humbling in that way to think that something's so small. And I think that really speaks to how much it was just kind of ready to bubble over, right, in that moment. Um, if that can be the real tipping point, you know, it seems that it was just one drop too far. Correct. That the, the sensitivity was so high um, because of all the things that you've already outlined, the climate of the time. Well, we live in a we live in a time. The polling shows we live in a time where white Americans believe yes. they are the victims of American racism, and this is not just Republicans and conservatives, right? We see a lot of centrist, anti woke, reactionary response. There's a lot of conversation across the political form where the average white American is now convinced that anti-white white racism is a, an active thing they are dealing with in some way. Yeah. Thank you for that. I mean, it's very, very clear and convincing and compelling in your book. I want to turn a little bit to talking about the resurgence of Black Lives Matter, because again, all of this is happening in tandem with one another. One line from your book that I think is especially important in thinking both about Black Lives Matter and the Trump presidency is, quote, America's racial history breaks less cleanly into a series of distinct succeeding time periods than it does into a singular, never-ending tug-of-war between diametrically opposed forces. Um, so in 2020, amidst the pandemic, the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd launched what some call the largest protest movement in U.S. history, with the Kaiser Family Foundation reporting that 26 million Americans participated in protests. These three murders eerily mirrored those of Trayvon, Martin, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner. Why do you think that the reaction was so much larger in scale? I think there are a few things. First, some of that is a reflection of how much has truly changed in this period of time. I think we also forget sometimes that movements take mm -hmm. real time. You think of the civil rights movement, like Martin Luther King got some friends together, they went to summer camp and fixed racism, right? There's a 15-year yeah. period between Brown versus Board of Education and the uh, Voting Rights Act and Civil Rights Act that involved a bunch of people getting murdered, right? Like this was like a very long period of time. By the time we get to 2020, so many people had now spent so much more time engaging these issues one way or the other. And I think that for a lot of Americans, their default back in 2010, 2011, 2012 was that, that there's a small minority of cases where maybe the police don't do something right, but that almost never happens. And if they do, they'll be held accountable. While I think that what this era did through these videos was it showed that there were a lot more gray area cases than people thought. You have the buildup, right? You have Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Aubrey, the Christian Cooper, Amy Cooper case in New York. Um, and then you have George Floyd on video. And then beyond that, all this is happening in the context of a Trump presidency, of a, of a global uh, epidemic and, and pandemic, mm -hmm. where people had been locked in their house, concerned about the state of the world and reality, had been pushed to the edge. And then they watched as a man died on video. Yeah. And so it was unsurprising to me that so many people said, I'm not sitting out this one. This has to stop. I'm doing something about this. Yeah, it was kind of the culmination of so many different things in that moment, it seems. But I do agree with you that it did seem to have grabbed a mainstream audience in a way that years earlier, it just it had still kind of been seen as a fringe effort by a lot of mainstream America. 
How do you feel that the demands of the resurgence of BLM evolved? Well, I think that each seceding chapter and each seceding season of this leads to an increase in the appetite for bigger and broader demands, right? But even as they've gotten bigger, the actual end goal hasn't gotten any bigger. It stayed the same, Mm -hmm. right? That, That we actually want an equal and equitable society. Some of those demands are fulfilled and the problem is not abated. And then it happens again. I think that in this moment, we, we I think we initially hit post-Ferguson, there was a reform era, right? We'll just put cameras on, we'll pass new policies, we'll do new trainings. Now we've been in what I think is more of a depolicing uh, era, where it's a question of, okay, who should we be sending to these calls? Should should Is this a call that should be two men with guns who show up for? Should someone else come? Do we need to do traffic enforcement the way we do traffic enforcement? Should we have a set of officers who are unarmed? Should right. we have armed officers in our schools. And what we're seeing in in a fair number of places is efforts to de-police. And what I mean by that is not not take officers off the streets in place where violence is happening, but this idea of the police do so many things in our society. And are we creating interactions with police that are unnecessarily leading to police violence when in fact this function could be served by someone else. Mm-hmm. And and those conversations, again, were unthinkable in 2012 or in 2014, at least to a mainstream audience. Mm, interesting. I'm interested that you actually think that because, you know, I think when we saw the murder of Tyree Nichols earlier this year, I think it also really calls into question some of the reforms that were advocated for since the beginning of Black Lives Matter. And- <laughs> I think a lot of people feel that way. And look, and I, and I wrote a piece for The Atlantic after Tyree Nichols where I said, you know, look, there was no great reckoning. And right. I think that we overstated. I think we can hold truths at the same time, right? I think that it is true that we did not come together in 2020 to solve racism, <laughs> right? We didn't fix it. And also that there were people who were doing work the day before the George Floyd video who continued doing that work. And and many of those people now had access to resources, to supporters, to networks that maybe they did not have. There are ideas that now are being piloted in places that before were just white papers, but now there's actually a department willing to try it, Mm -hmm. right? Those things do move forward. And so again, that's not to say it's happening everywhere. It's to say it's fixed all these big things. But what is true is that we will now have more information about which of these strategies work and which they don't. There, it's now not so radical because someone has done it, right? So then tomorrow, if there's such a video and I'm a police chief who wants to show that I'm one of the good ones, maybe I do try that thing that's been proven somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. I do think Tyree Nichols underscored the extent to which the reforms and representational victories could not and did not solve the problem. That here we had a man a black man in a majority black city run by a black woman police chief with majority black officers who brutalized him to death on their body cameras. Mm -hmm. One other notable shift I think that we've seen is criminal liability that police officers are facing in these high-profile police brutality cases. During the first iteration of BLM, nearly all the police officers who had killed someone were not held criminally responsible. But since the resurgence, we've now seen many police officers who kill black civilians getting charged, some even convicted. Is it fair to say that transparency and accountability have improved? How much of this is indicative of systemic change rather than just merely individual concessions? I I think that this is indicative of the evidence being better. We have more video. Mm. The tech has improved. I think very little else has changed, right? The reality is more of these incidents are caught on video, which means that prosecutors very often can see with their own eyes that crimes have been committed. The majority of these cases do not result in convictions or or charges still, right? The majority of them are not caught on video. But what we are seeing is cases where it is very clear based on the video that without the video, there would not be charges. Without the video in Philando Steel, there's no way there would have been charges. Uh, without the video in George Floyd, it seems very unlikely there would have been charges, right? And, and so the, what that video allows is for us to see with our own eyes what happened in these circumstances and not have to rely on the word of the police officers. Yeah. And I think even with the technology, I think many of us were not so convinced that it would bear out to to feel like there was some some kind of justice. 
No, I, I remember. I remember watching that verdict and mm-hmm. you know really not being sure. I, I think I, if I remember correctly, I, I thought it was more likely than not he would be convicted. And I think what's also true in these moments is that in the same way that representational victories. Uh, do not necessarily lead to a revolutionary or radical or reform of politics, right? Individual moments of accountability do not necessarily equate justice. You know, as I talk to activists and organizers, you know, one thing that I think a lot of them keep at the top of their mind is that, you know, their goal is not necessarily convictions, right? It's not right. that their goal is, is a world where this doesn't happen in the first place. Exactly. And we certainly haven't achieved that. Uh, we know we know that there's not been any substantive change in how often the police are killing people. Right. To pick up on a thread that you mentioned a little bit earlier when we were talking about the way the different hate crimes, so to speak, that you wanted to feature in the book, that you felt that you needed to represent just how white supremacy and the KKK, the ethos. Uh, was all about lumping a bunch of other anxieties, such as reaction against urbanization and feminism into its messaging, promising to restore, in quotes, traditional American values, if you will. And I wonder, like, what you make of this moment that we're living in right now. I think that we, you know, I encourage a lot of people to read up on the 1920s. There was a great book, American Midnight, um, and there's a few others that have come out, because this moment, this broad conservative nativist movement that we're seeing, right, is extremely analogous to the rise in the second clan uh, that we saw in the 1920s. A political party that was geographically diverse, not of the South, in fact, had many of its strongholds in the North. Their enemies were not just Black people, in fact, were primarily immigrants and Jews, uh, Catholics. They were backlashing to the change fundamentally in the country, both demographically, but also economically. Uh, the, the 20s are a time when, for the first time in American history, more people live in urban settings than rural settings. That new technology was changing the way things worked. Even as there's deep income inequality, uh, you have these massive advances in our understandings of race and gender and sexuality, right? And the more you learn about the 1920s, the more you go, well, this seems a lot like what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that the better we understand that, the better we can remedy it and try to address it. Um, I, I think that there's a mistake sometimes that we make, that we believe that we enter these moments and they're unique as, as opposed to them being moments that we've encountered before. Yeah, it's important to acknowledge. Uh, I wonder how we move forward in approaching the fear around this shift in demographics that we see in, in many American localities. It's in fact true And so how do we contend with that, given the kind of racial fear that is clearly permeating the country? Well, look, I think think first and foremost, um, in an ideal world, all of our public figures and political parties would be responsible with this rhetoric. We know that this type of rhetoric leads to violence. It's not theoretical. It's not an idea. We have history shows us we've seen it. And I think that there probably is room for some sustained effort around uh, facilitating conversation, soothing some of those anxieties. But it's really, really hard in a world in which we have big, powerful institutions and people, political parties, who are willing to make money to drive political motivation um, around this type of demagogy. It's one of the most powerful human motivators that we know of, is the fear yeah. of people who are different than us. And And as long as there are people with massive megaphones willing to exploit that, we're going to continue to see uh, acts of violence being carried out. It's sad but true. Um, Yeah, I I think that we obviously explore a lot of different issues on the podcast, and it really does feel like so many of our fights link back to this uh, fear of the unfamiliar or fear of the of someone who is different than you. It feels silly to kind of boil it down to that point because it feels so uh, small and yet it is really powerful. And I do think that that there is that interconnected thread that we see across a lot of the issues that we work on. I want to ask about Black Lives Matter 
slash the movement for Black Lives, um, it seems to be at a crossroads. Public opinion for the movement has fallen. The Black Lives Matter National Organization is on the brink of bankruptcy. An op-ed ran in the New York Times a few weeks ago titled, America is more and less safe since the Black Lives Matter movement. How would you characterize where the movement stands right now? And and do you concern yourself for its future? Like, are you concerned about its future? I'm not concerned about its future in so much as as long as there are Black Americans, there will be people fighting for us to have a society that is truly equal and equitable, and that no matter what we call it, uh, this movement, this anti-racist movement, has always existed. And it comes and goes in different forms, right? I think that one of the things about BLM um, and the, or the movement for Black Lives, uh, you know, however you want to word it, is that it was always something that was hard to hold in your hand because it was always made up of a ton of different moving pieces and parts. But that's always been true of activism and in every space, mm-hmm. in every sense, right? But I think that more people today are equipped with more information and a more educated sense of these issues, of the problems, and of the potential solutions than has ever been true before. And certainly more so than was true before those first uh, demonstrators stepped in the streets, before that hashtag was tweeted for the first time. Um, and so I think it's, it's, in so much as we can measure that, um, I, I do think that that, that really matters. Um, unfortunately, we know there will be another Trayvon Martin we know there will be another Michael Brown. We know there'll be another Breonna Taylor. We know there'll be another George Floyd. And we know that the radicalizing events that drove these people into the streets, into their organizations to do this work are unfortunately not things that have been stopped yet. We know that as long as this problem exists, there will be people who are radicalized by it who test- take to the streets and attempt to solve it. Is that where you find hope? I think so. I accepted a long time ago as a journalist that my job is to record things Mm -hmm. accurately, to write down what the world was like in my time, in my era, so that people will know. And that it is an added benefit if by recording these things and writing them down, that creates change in Mm -hmm. my lifetime. But for me, the aim is to chronicle these things. And by chronicling them, you do start to see some of the changes that happen. Um, And you do see new generations of people rising up behind me who know more than I ever could have known. I was spoken like a true journalist, I have to say. Um, (laughs) I do what I can. You mentioned that you don't write light books. Um, A review of your first book said, quotes, his book is so evidently the work of a man who has not grown a callus on his heart. The same can be said of your second book, which features... Details of you visiting the site of each shooting you cover and vignettes on the, of the lives left in the victim's wake. How do you personally, in your line of work and journalism, fight against desensitization that we, we all can face as these videos of the disregard for Black lives continue to circulate with a numbing frequency and, and we you know have to continue talking about the same things over and over and over? How do you... Think about that for yourself, but also and how you present information to the public. Yeah, I think a lot of it is, for me personally, but then also hopefully through my work, is not ever wanting people to become symbols. I, I think that there's a sometimes in our in our efforts to seek justice for someone, there's a desire to make a martyr of them, and I understand that impulse. And I also think that sometimes in erasing or coloring around things that we that may be less flattering we can in some ways do a disservice to the person, right? Because it's not just angels who deserve justice, right? It's not, it's just not, not just perfect people who deserve justice, right? Because I hope not, because then I wouldn't, right? Be, right? Like the reality is we live in a world that is complicated and difficult and complex. Humans are human, right? No one's all good or all bad. And so for me, what I think is a unique privilege of the position I'm in is that in these cases, I get to really sit with and spend time with these families and these people and get to see them as three-dimensional human beings, not just as a person in the news or a person who's been killed. And, you know, I, I think that to do this work, we have to have a love of people. And I understand people sometimes say, well, that's why I don't want to do it or I can't do it. because I get, right. And I think for me, 
when we see a video like Philando Castile or we see a video like George Floyd, I think so many of us of different political persuasions or different backgrounds, so many people say, I want to do, this is wrong. I don't like this. I want to do something mm-hmm. about it. And what I really value is that in my line of work, in that moment, when I have that feeling, there's something mm-hmm. for me to do. There's someone for me to call. There's context I can write that my role in helping can be to help explain to other people. And that gives my mind and my brain a place to go that isn't despair and isn't pain. Um, and, and so that's something I've always really valued about my role kind of in this, um, you know, in, in this paradigm. I really resonate with what you just said, that in those moments you get to actually have something to do. I often say the same thing for the work that we do at the ACLU. Wesley, this has been lovely to speak with you. Thank you so much for all of your work. Thanks for the book. People can check that out. Of course. Well, thank you so much for the work you do and for the great conversation. Um, And uh, happy to join you anytime. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to At Liberty wherever you get your podcasts and rate and review the show. We really appreciate the feedback. At Liberty is a production of the ACLU, produced by me, Kendall Seesmeyer, Vanessa Handy, and Rachel Kennedy. This episode was edited by Matt Boynton. Lila Sheridan is our intern. Until next week, stay strong. 